Well, that's interesting. Just like that, um, book two of Legend of Korra is over. Um, they had the normal premiere on Friday of, of well, not normal. They had a special premiere of two episodes, um, Night of a Thousand Stars and Harmonic Conversions. I wrote other names down because there's five episodes I have to go through now. Uh, and then the, the next two were apparently leaked online intentionally. I, I've heard they were getting bad ratings, so maybe they were hoping that showing them online and building up buzz about them would get better ratings on the finale. I don't know. Uh, I'm not not being in the States and not being up to date in the news. I can't say what inspired that. But uh, there it is. The season is over. So because I was not able to do an earlier video for A New Spiritual Age, I'm not going to do one for each one of these episodes. Instead, I'm going to run through each of the last five episodes very quickly and offer a few thoughts I had on each one of them specifically. I'm, I'm going to take these off. Light keeps reflect, reflecting on them. It's annoying. Um, offer a few thoughts on each of them separately, and then I'm going to jump right into my thoughts, my initial thoughts on the series as a whole. A follow-up, more in-depth discussion of this season I will post to my blog, uh, and then I will uh, put a link, I'll put on another video with a link to that site. Um, okay, so episode 10, uh, New Spiritual Age. Obviously, the big deal there was Iroh making an appearance. I fanboyed. There's no, sh no shame in that. Um, really good episode, very well animated. And <laughs> what I found amusing was they finally got Korra to be an interesting main character by shrinking her down to a five-year-old. It was good, it was well done, uh, and it was a good journey. It was like a little short film, really getting, finally getting us interested in Korra as a character, which, as I've said before, has constantly been the main weakness for this new show. Korra has not been a solid main character. Looks like that that's changed in these past few episodes. Let's hope it stays that way. Uh, so that was a very good episode, and it set up the conflict well, and great ending shot uh, with Jinora getting captured, and the... the Tenzin as a character really shown. You could hear the terror in his voice when she doesn't wake up, and the last shot of Korra's face, like, crying. It was a great ending. Very good episode. Then, uh, part one of the four-part finale mashup, Night of a Thousand Stars. This had the movie bit with Bolin. Um, turns out those two cops weren't corrupt, they were just incompetent. It was fun how they, it was, it was fun how they had Bolin get some, get a chance to really shine and not just be an idiot, and how they had that reflect the movie. Um, I, th I thought that was very well done. It was very interesting. Uh, t -t -t what else? Oh, uh, Korra. So everyone gets reunited back at Republic City. Very conveniently, but I'll forgive it at this point. Uh, they briefly brought back the love triangle, but it was mercifully brief, like getting a tooth yanked out. It hurt for a few minutes, and then it subsided into a dull ache that I could push in the back of my mind. Oh, God, was I angry about that this season. So that was briefly, briefly happened again. We see that um, Asami is burned, and Asami does nothing else for the rest of the season. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that later. Okay. Uh, the bit with Farrakh. <laughs> Here's the great thing about Varric. Even when his plan has failed, his very flimsy plan failed and he was thrown in jail, he's still the funnest, most interesting character in the show. Even in jail, he's like, oh, I failed. I'm in jail now. And he's just... he's just, ah, it's, If anything were to bring me to watch this whole season again from start to finish, it would be Varric. Okay, so from after Night of a Thousand Stars, we had Harmonic Conversions, where... Um, the Dark Spirit is freed and begins to fight Korra and the others. Not much I can think of to say about that episode. I like that they gave Boomy a chance to, to, to shine, um, to show... Sort of like how, how Sokka had his moments. He, he's very much like Sokka. He's like he's, he's the quick... He, he's, uh, he's a bit of a wisecracker, but he's, he's quick on his feet and he's clever and he's intelligent, like, like Sokka was, and that was how they... That was how Sokka compensated for not having bending. He came up with these crazy plans and was able to get things done. Boomy had a chance to do that here. That was good. Uh, then Darkness Falls, that was primarily the fight between um, Korra and Dark Unalak. Great fight. I I have no criticisms of any of the... When we have gotten bending and when we have gotten 
fights in Legend of Korra, they've been top-notch. I have no complaints about that. Uh, best part of the episode, though, for me, was the bit with the uh, the Fog of Lost Souls. Freaking Zhao! What a... You know, the, the Iroh was great, but given that he was one of, if not the most beloved character from The Last Airbender, it's not entirely shocking they would try to work him in. I, I, I did not see them pulling Zhao back in there. Uh, of course, our assumption has been that he was drowned to death by the water spirit, but nope, he was cast into a valley of eternal fog to contemplate in his in own insanity. Great, great little reveal there. Great ending for Zhao. Um, and that whole bit was, was especially powerful because it's where Tenzin... You know, we've seen Tenzin fail to to match up to what he sees for himself, and here we really get a great character moment where he confronts that, and he overcomes it, and he overcomes the fog uh, because of that. Uh, so that was a great moment for Tenzin. He, on the whole, and I'll jump into this later, on the whole, I think Tenzin had the best arc out of all the individual characters. He had the best overall arc this season. Um, and then the last episode, Light in the Dark, which is the, the final fight, um, also good. I could have done without them going super size and throwing Kamehameha waves at each other. I, I, I'm betting a lot of people will be pissed off about that or, or will just find it stupid. I found it tolerable. I thought the bending fight was much more interesting. Uh, they, they could have done the spirit fight a lot better, I thought. And it's another Deus Ex Machina, um... Rava is destroyed, but not really, and Jinora just finds her somehow. It's another Deus Ex Machina. It's the third time they've done this, but it's not its not as bad as last season. It's not on par, because it does make sense that Rava would still be there somewhere, and they just have to find her. Maybe it would have been better if they'd left that for another season, but again, from what I understand, Nickelodeon, is, they, they've had the constant threat of having this, this show pulled out from under their, their feet. Um... So maybe that's just the fact that they were still uncertain as to whether or not Nintendo was going to, or um, Nickelodeon was going to pull the plug on this. Uh, so on the whole, I thought it was a good finale. Not, with the exception of the Deus Ex Machina, I thought the finale of Season 1 was, was excellent, was very well done. This one, not quite as much. Once they go super big and it starts to get really over the top, that was where it started to lose me. Up until that point, I thought it was very strong. But that fight, eh, I'll let it. I I'll let it go. It's not that big a deal. Uh, okay, so okay, we're at the eight minute mark. I'll tr I'll try and make this as brief as possible. So, what do I think of this season as a whole? A lot like season one, it's good. It's not great. There are a lot of structural problems. A lot of really rough patches in it, especially early on, and especially in regards to Cora's character. Good lord, was she frustrating prior to her losing her memory. Um, so, very much like season one, good, but distinctly flawed enough that it's not great. Even though some moments in it were very great. The highlights, the beginning, beginnings part one and two, the expansion of the world, wonderful. All the stuff with Tenzin and his family, I can't think of any stuff with Tenzin and his siblings or with his kids that wasn't at least at least really good, if not excellent. Uh, like I said, I think Tenzin had the best overall character arc in this season. Fun, Most fun character was, was Varric. Uh, he was just a ball to watch. Mako and Boleyn had some good moments. You know, we, we got a little bit more of them as brothers. Um... But nothing really... The issue was... All right, so here, here is where the show really fell apart for me. There was no clear villain from point A to point B. I mean, there was Unalak, but after... The, and the stuff with him was interesting in the first few episodes, but then he disappears for whole stretches of it, and he briefly reappears until right before the finale. And he really was just another version of Tarlux, so it was not possible for us to get that interested in him. Uh, and we never got into how he came into contact with the Dark Spirit, or how he heard the story, or how he came to the conclusions that he did. Whereas with Tarlock, we had a great backstory. He and uh, he and Noah Talk had great backstories uh, that really explained why they were both doing what they did. We had nothing like that with Unalak. He was just oh, straight up evil, and that's not interesting. Um, the Dark Spirit was cool, but he was just very briefly brought in at the end. Uh, so neither of them really worked as the main villain, so that was a weakness. 
Um, the twins, the relationship stuff, especially the stuff with the twins, was pretty funny. I was personally bothered by the fact that Asami was almost non-existent this season, but given the fact that the focus was more on spiritual aspects, that sort of makes sense. That's a personal nitpick of mine. I'm, I'm not going to like hold the show up to that and try to be objective about it. I would have liked to see more Asami, but I get why she was sort of pushed to the side. All of the stuff in Republic City, I did not like. Thinking back on that, all the stuff with the mo- the stuff of the movie was cute. It was a nice little parody from you know twenties boomer culture, um, but none of it really stuck with me. None of it. It, it, it was where the show was easily at its weakest. It's where they brought the relationship bullcrap back in. It's where they had the weird subplot with the cops. That that was where Korra was at her worst um, as a character. Um, that was when she just became an absolute jerk and was just hor- inexcusably horrible uh, to Mako. So they had that going on. Uh, what else? There was the stuff with the president, which is sort of a... They go to him to get help, and several times he says, no, I'm not going to help you. Um, they had the final battle there. They didn't need to. It's a big world. Why do they keep going back to Republic City? Um, we, we need more information about where exactly the, what the new power dynamic is. Like, what is Republic City just ruling over this city? Or is it supposed to be like a world government thing? That's still very vague. Um, so yeah, the, the stuff with Republic City took up way more time than it needed to. It was not necessary and it, it added nothing. Um, it didn't add any character development or anything like that. It was just padding. It, it was filler of the non-necessary kind. I said this show needed more filler. That's not the kind of filler I was talking about. So all the stuff with Republic City I could have done away with. It bothers me. Um, another thing that bothers me was how little they ended up doing with the brothers. The the dad's like, oh, we're going to start a resistance. Ten episodes later, all right, time to start the resistance. And then the resistance is crushed in an instant. I liked the dynamic they started with in the first few episodes. It was interesting, and then they just dropped it. And it's an, it, it's inexplicable to me. I, I don't know why... Again, I don't know why any of the stuff in Republic City had to happen. Um... So, yeah, I, I've delved into the conclusion. Slight deus ex machina with Jinor suddenly finding the good spirit. Um, not a terrible, not as terrible a deus ex machina as last season, but it's still... Uh, you know, people have criticized what, what Aang did at the end of Last Airbender as sort of being a deus ex machina, or at least a cop-out. But it still made sense. Like, he had to go through a process of seeking, of searching for an answer. Um... And the answer he came to, you know, was one that made sense within the rules of the world. Um, so it was a, the type of Deus Ex Machina that works, and that is is fairly well done. Last season it was rushed. I get why they had no idea how long they were going to be able to do this. Actually, that brings me to the other big issue I have with this conclusion. It was a good conclusion, having this, you know, fight between light and darkness, and using that to explain the creation of the Avatar. That was all interesting. With the exception of the giant super body Kamehameha fight, uh, um, the the bending battles at least were very good, were very well done. Um, what the hell are they going to do after this? Once you've had a light versus darkness battle that only happens once every ten thousand years, where do you go after that? This is where most shows would end. My suspicion is that they had to start production on this right after they finished with book one, before they had confirmation that they would be able to do two more seasons. Um, so they had to commit to doing... They, this was what this was how they wanted to, at least initially, this was how they wanted to end it, but they had to throw in it early because they didn't know if they'd be able to do any, any of the other stuff. And then later Nickelodeon said, oh, we'll give you two more seasons. Um, I'll see if I can find anything out about that because I'm not... It's weird. I mean, you know, Korra has this whole proclamation of there being a new age. I like the idea of this new age of the spirits, spirits and humanity having to mix. I assume the next two seasons will focus on that. Um, but it, it seems to be... They, they seem to have gone a very similar route to season one with this. I think this was, this was where they wanted to be. They wanted to have Korra at a point where, like with Aang, 
in Season 3 of Last Airbender. Aang in Season 3 did not have the Avatar state. There was the chance that that connection was broken. He had to find a way to, to reforge it or to do without it. They tried doing that. They've done that with Korra twice now. This is the second time that Korra um, has lost an aspect of her powers or her Avatar abilities. And this, it looks like this is not just going to be given back to her right off the bat. So if they were to spend the, the, the next two seasons of this show focusing on her trying to reforge her connection to the past avatars, that would be really interesting. I'd be interested in seeing that. If you've heard my blog, you know that I don't have a good track record predicting what the show will, will do and not do. Um, but that's where I hope they go in these next two seasons. Um, and so, yeah, so on the whole, a good season, not as good as season one, surprisingly, not as good as season one, despite some very, very strong moments within it, um, very flawed, but despite that, and I, I'm, I am a core apologist, I've, I've realized, despite that, I will, abs at the drop of a hat, I will go to bat and def for the show and defend it, uh, because I'm still, I'm still very happy and very grateful that we have the show, despite all of its major flaws, for two reasons. Number one, uh, the, the whole world of the Avatar, that they, that they began with Last Airbender, it, it's too good of a world to just leave with one show and, and be done with it. That's why I'm glad they're doing the graphic novels, I'm glad they're doing a series. This series, I'm glad they dipped back into a bit of the history with beginnings. This is a great, this is, like, this is a fantasy world on par with that of, in my opinion, on par with that of Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter, or Game of Thrones, like, this really rich and interesting world that has a lot of potential. And... I'm glad, number one, I'm glad that they're, uh, I, I'm glad that they're sticking with it, that they're trying to expand it further. It's not a world that I think should just be left alone. Um, I like the fact that they're trying to give us more of it. And that brings me to my second point. I like the fact that they are clearly, they're really trying to go out of their comfort zone. They deliberately, they've deliberately made Legend of Korra a very different animal to Last Airbender. It's in a different time period, different culture, different very modern culture, uh, and it looks and feels very different from Last Airbender. I like that. I like that they're branching out. They're taking a big risk with this show. It's not always paying off. They're not always hitting. They're not always hitting all the right points with it. But they're branching out, which is more than what most TV shows do, especially animated shows. I like the fact that they're they're taking risks with the story. They're taking risks in a setting that that a lot of people might reject. And a lot of people have rejected it. A lot of people have stopped watching the show because it's just too different. Um, it's going darker. We've had people pretty much killed on screen uh, in both of these seasons, which never happened in Last Airbender. That never happened. Not even Jets. And I will, I will fight you on that. So there's nothing... Simply put, I'm really happy we have Korra, and despite all of its flaws, and despite the number of times that it does bother me, that certain aspects of the show have bothered me, I'm really happy we have this show, because it is so fundamentally different from anything going on in American anime right now. We don't have any other show coming out of the States that is trying to be this creative, this imaginative, that is giving us such a rich and fascinating world to experience, even if it's a flawed experience. And even when the show hits a low point, even the parts of this show that have been bad have been the kind of bad, the kind of frustrating that have come from people clearly trying to create something good and occasionally trying too hard. Um, and that's, you know, I'll take that sort of bad. I'll take that sort of frustrating because at, at least it's interesting. At least it shows that there's still people out there who really believe in, in animation and, kid, and, and sh animated shows as an art form. Uh, and are trying to do something with that. They're they're they've repeated themselves a bit. They've stumbled a bit with the show, but they're darn it, they're trying. And I'm I'm glad we have that. I'm I'm glad we have something like that to enjoy. Um, yeah. So those are my initial thoughts on the conclusion of Legend of Korra Book Two. Like I said, um, stay tuned. I will post a video when I have a full, a longer, more detailed written blog about book two and what I really think about it. Um, yeah, this was an interesting ride. It was a fun ride. I, I enjoyed the season and we'll see whenever they decide to release season three in another two years. So until then.